Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA, Episode 97 for the week ending April 6, 2018, the Facebook FUBAR edition. This Week in FCPA is sponsored by Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional integrity, monitoring, and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 700 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance programs, visit Affiliated Monitors at their website, www.affiliatedmonitors.com. With the Astros off to a 6-2 and two start and the Facebook food bar continuing, Jay Rosen and myself look at some of the week's top compliance and ethics stories. We uh, consider the Embraer dodgment of a shareholder derivative action based upon its FCPA violations, whether or not Facebook gets it and continues to throw its users under the bus or it'll change. We consider a great resource uh, published by Maurice Gilbert, uh, Cillian Search over on his site, Corporate Compliance Insights on Hiring Compliance Officers. We take a look at a blog post by Bob Conlon, the CEO at Navex, explaining why CEO trust is so low. We explain or at least consider the SEC uh, whistleblower safe harbor rule, as Henry Cutter reported on in the Wall Street Journal Risk and Compliance Journal. Mike Volkoff put on a great podcast on how to do deal with uh, search warrants in his site, Crime, Corruption, and, or Corruption, Crime, and Compliance, rather. And finally, we review the five-part podcast series on corporate monitorships I did this week with Jay's colleagues, Ben DeCiani and Eric Feldman from Affiliated Monitors. Uh, there's lots to slice and dice in this episode, lots to consider from the compliance and ethics perspective. I know you'll enjoy it. This is Tom Fox. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back again for another episode of This Week in FCPA with my good friend and colleague, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors. Today, we have episode 97 for the week ending, April 6, 2018, the Facebook FUBAR edition. Jay, uh, as always, welcome. Thanks, Tom. Uh it's fun to be back in the swing of uh, baseball season, and uh, just like the 162 games that we'll be watching over the next six months, uh, there's lots of action on the FCPA ethics and compliance front. So, uh, shall we dive right in? Let's uh, let's take it. So, Jay, um, we had a really interesting, I thought, um, shareholder derivative action lawsuit decision. This week, involving Embraer, the Brazilian airline manufacturer who sustained a, a very large Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violation for uh, multiple bribery schemes over multiple countries a couple of years ago or 18 months or so ago. And this was a shareholder action claiming that uh, Embraer did not properly disclose the um, information and thereby uh, defrauded the shareholders. And the uh, district court dismissed the case on a 12B6 motion, which is the motion you use in federal court. And there was, uh, I thought, some pretty interesting uh, things. Uh, the court really um, took a look at the allegations and found that simply because a company discloses a FCPA violation, they do not have a duty to disclose uncharged, uh, unadjudicated wrongdoings, that talking about the business activities of a subsidiary uh, once again, does not require you to disclose uncharged and unadjudicated wrongdoings. Uh, financial statements are not misleading um, when they don't have um, they haven't taken into account any potential FCPA fines and penalties because a violation of federal securities law cannot be premised on a company's disclosure of historical financial data. The um, for the compliance practitioners. This uh, next point was, um, I thought, one of the most interesting and certainly one of the most debated, which is the trial court judge agreed with several other trial court judges that codes of conduct 
uh, policies and procedures are not um, things that can be violated. They're aspirational, and they're not violations of federal securities laws when companies breach these. So uh, whereas uh, certainly the Securities and Exchange Commission takes the position that if you have a code of conduct and if you had a policy and procedure and you and you violate those without an appropriate reason, that's a violation of internal controls. Here in federal securities law, that does not appear to be the um, uh, situation, at least as many courts have interpreted. And finally, uh, near and dear to my heart was one of the greatest lines of all time, that there was a temporal disconnect between the time frame of the incidents at issue or the facts at issue, basically from 04 to uh, 08 or, or 2010, and the statute of limitations. Um, so there's five-year statute of limitations. Uh, this uh, case was filed in 2016, so that took it back to 2011. And what the uh, judge found was that there was a, a temporal disconnect, uh, or as I would say, rift in the space-time continuum that did not allow any uh, fraudulent actions or statements by the company to be actionable as uh, shareholder claims. So um, uh, most of the reading I just took, Jay, was from uh, Kevin LaCroix's excellent recitation of the case and his always great DNO diary. Um, uh, Mm -hmm. Henry Cutter also reported on it in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, I took, of course, the uh, Star Trek space-time continuum angle uh, yesterday in my blog And, Jay, I have to note, and this is officially for the record, that today is the 50th anniversary of the release of the greatest Star Trek television episode ever, City on the Edge of Forever, which is the episode where um, James T. Kirk and Mr. Spock travel back to 1930s America, where Kirk falls in love with Joan Collins' character, and they go through uh-huh. a time portal. So we, in that case, we had a complete displacement of the time-space continuum and time travel. Uh, what we did not have in the Embraer Securities action was actual time travel. We uh, we had just the temporal disconnect. So in um, Kevin's article, one of the things that I found interesting is you um, usually see a lot of these follow-on derivative suits after a company's been announced to have an ongoing FCPA investigation. And he said uh, a majority of the time these cases do not come to fruition, but especially in this situation when we are talking about the uh, the temporal gap here – is they brought charges on a time period that wasn't even covered when the investigation was ongoing and when it was announced um, in the company's financials. So, um, you know, it, what, these kind of rote reactions, these knee-jerk uh, shareholder suits don't usually uh, tend to pan out. And uh, Kevin covers that uh, quite well in his article, and we'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, next up, we have one of your favorite companies, Facebook. And um, not only do we still have this uh, public relations nightmare that's going on, but uh, we've got a couple articles that we're going to refer to about how do you write the ship and, and how do you get things going and regain trust. So, um, Jay, this just uh, this is going to be, I think, uh, up there with Wells Fargo, Uber, Volkswagen is the story that keeps on giving. And from the compliance perspective, we've got lots of sort of tactical or technical points we we could explore. <clears throat> but from the broader ethics perspective, uh, I think this is going to be a really instructive case uh, because it literally does start with the top of the organization. And we had um, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, give an interview this week uh, where it was pretty clear that um, he just doesn't get it and that the business model of Facebook has been to not protect privacy and data of users, but to collect as much information and disseminate that out for profit. 
uh, i.e. sell it to advertisers, Cambridge Analytica type folks or others, and that uh, there is a, a real disconnect in that between what the public wants. Now, Facebook is a business, and let's we have to acknowledge that it's a business, but uh, if we take a step back and look at um, just a, I thought, horrific memo that what was leaked uh, last week by a, a Facebook vice president named Andrew, uh, uh, not by him, it was authored by this fella, Facebook vice president Andrew Bosworth, a.k.a. the Boz, where he stated that maybe some someone dies in a terrorist attack coordinated on our tools and we still connect people. The ugly truth is we believe in connecting people so deeply that anything that allows us to connect more people is often the de facto good. The, um, uh, the problem with that is that uh, it's, it's taking a step of business over kind of the privacy rights of, of others. Now, um, Bosworth claims that he wrote this memo uh, tongue-in-cheek, and uh, he has disavowed it. Uh, CEO Zuckerberg has uh, disavowed it. Uh, but in the same article that rep- reported on it, it indicated that uh, Facebook was desperately trying to find the uh, whistleblower who leaked this memo to BuzzFeed where it was published, um, which is certainly is troubling. And even more troubling is that uh, there was uh, comments from unnamed Facebook sources quoted in the article that maybe Facebook needed to try and weed out whistleblowers in their hiring process. Uh, if you know any of that is is close to the truth, Jay, that really uh, sets a tone at the top that is not only incredibly destructive, it's also incredibly disturbing. And if the company really believes that it uh, is that paranoid, uh, it's going to have a lot of trouble. Uh, now we have to overlay that with uh, they are the largest data collection firm in literally in the world because they have more members than anyone in the world. I think it's 2 billion at latest count. So they've got information on a lot of people and they're going to have to change, I think, their attitude and uh, first uh, ethically, and then they're going to have to move to uh, changing some of the uh, compliance obligations and requirements. Yesterday, Sheryl Sandberg, in an interview on ABC, I believe, uh, actually admitted that they knew about the Cambridge Analytica scandal for two years. And basically didn't do anything. Uh, what they did was uh, wave a confidentiality agreement in the face of Cambridge and say, uh, we're re- we are relying on you to follow this uh, guideline. Now, this is in the face of Cambridge Analytica sending terms and conditions to them, which were in opposite to the confidentiality agreement. But even more importantly, from the Facebook compliance perspective, they did nothing to ascertain whether Cambridge Analytica was following the requirements of the confidentiality agreement. So I they, e- made, uh, they made a mistake that would uh, anger not only the man from FCPA, but the Gipper himself, who always said, trust but verify. And there was no verification at all in this huge, huge mistake. Indeed. Now, uh, we do, I think, have to acknowledge that uh, Facebook is free. And if you're not paying for a service, uh, guess what? You're the product. And that's what Facebook's attitude is, Jay. You and I are the product because we're the ones that have the data and we're the ones that have the private information that advertisers, that uh, political consulting firms and a wide variety of others want. So that's the trade-off that individuals have made, that we are giving them our data. Let me emphasize giving them our data. And uh, they are uh, slicing, dicing, and marketing it to people who would use that data. So um, there's lots of trade-offs going over here, but Facebook's uh, tone has made it clear that they're all about the data. They're not about the individuals or the privacy, and that's uh, something that uh, I think Facebook is going to have to change um, and really think about what their business model is and how they are going to protect the data, if at all. Um, Certainly the marketplace has reacted uh, in terms of the price of the stock uh, has gone down. But if the regulators come in and take over, um, there's going to be a regulatory um, sanction to pay, whether that's in the United States or in the uh, Europe or uh, or the U.K., 
So a couple quick uh, questions and then we'll move on. Do you think they need to go the route of Uber in uh, commission an independent study? Is that going to help them at all? And then look into your crystal ball and uh, do Zuckerberg and Sandberg uh, survive or do, does somebody need to uh, take the fall for this? Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, I am I'm really not sure that um, a uh, Covington and Burling type uh, investigation and report is uh, in the cards yet. Uh, we should note that Mark Zuckerberg is scheduled to testify in front of Congress this coming Wednesday, April 11th. I certainly hope uh, to watch that. It's um, there's been a large debate about whether he should, because apparently uh, unscripted public speaking is not his forte. So, um, frankly, I hope he doesn't embarrass himself uh, and the company uh, in the political theater that is a uh, congressional hearing. But that's going to be the starting point. And he has already admitted that there probably needs to be more regulation around this. Uh, Zuckerberg is the largest shareholder, and uh, I don't think he can be uh, – even if the board revolted, I'm not sure they, they could get rid of him without his um, uh, agreement to that. As far as Sandberg staying on, she's always been viewed as the adult in the room. So um, uh, she may be viewed as as – needing to stay on uh, for that reason. But I think we'll probably know a little bit more after the congressional hearing, just uh, from the tone of Zuckerberg, whether he can actually respond to the congressional inquiry. Uh, It turns out that this company, although public, really is uh, a very opaque organization, Jay. And uh, as more is revealed to us, I think there's going to be more people uh, who recoil from this uh, but the bottom line is we have all given them our data, and uh, we have trusted that they will uh, not abuse it. And so from the legal perspective, unless there's a change in the law, I'm not sure uh, anything would happen. But just imagine if all of this had happened after May 25, 2018, when GDPR goes live, and you're looking at a fine of 4% of global revenues. Um, so the clock is pretty ticking pretty fast on Facebook to clean this up because even if it started before GDPR goes live, if they're still violating GDPR after it goes live, um, uh, it's now a GDPR violation. So, uh, there's a pretty heavy sanctions out there if they don't get their house in order and there's not much time to do so. Well, I hope they've reached out to Jonathan Armstrong to get them all straight. You know, we can certainly only hope so. So uh, here's something from a, a good friend of ours. Uh, why don't you tell us about 10 interview questions and answers hiring compliance that you should use when hiring compliance officers? Okay, so here, here Jay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up, and then I'm going to pitch it over to you if, if you can maybe go through any of those that would uh, interest you or, or you want to highlight. But I just want to talk about Maurice sure. Gilbert and Corporate Compliance Insights because – um, Maurice Gilbert is probably, uh, if not the, w- certainly one of the top compliance recruiters in the United States. If your company looks to hire a chief compliance officer, you need to retain Maurice and his company. If you are a chief compliance officer looking to move, you need to know Maurice, Maurice Gilbert. Um, he knows everybody. He knows everything. And he's got his finger on the pulse of the market as well as anyone I know. But for the rest of us who may not be looking, he provides truly one of the great compliance social media presences in America with his site, Corporate Compliance Insights. He has literally a wealth of information. He has uh, eBooks. He has articles. He has videos. Uh, He curates and posts one of the great resources uh, there is. And I've had the opportunity to interview Maurice uh, several times about what you need to do in the hiring process, both from the company perspective and the uh, stakeholder perspective, or rather the individual uh, who may be looking perspective. And we wanted to highlight a, a ebook he has posted called Hiring Compliance Officers. Uh, the, Jay, the reason I wanted to uh, highlight it is I had the opportunity to take a look at it and use it. And it's a great resource for companies, and it's a great resource for individuals. Because if you're out there uh, looking or want to look, uh, this tells you 
what the types of questions will be uh, you'll you'll be asked. So uh, I don't know if you had the chance to to take a look at it, but if, if there were anything that uh, really struck you as as something that uh, you might not have thought of or that you uh, particularly uh, thought were important, maybe you could highlight a couple of pieces from it. Yeah, um, you, you know the the things that really um, stood out to me is that when you're going into an interview, you're you're going to prep for a company. You're going to, you know, if they're publicly traded, you're you're going to look at their results. But Maurice uh, shares several very uh, incisive questions here that when you ask them about uh, a candidate's current experience with the company that they're working at right now, it really provides um, some insight into how they would perform. So a couple uh, questions that I think are really great is question number six is, what do you believe are the greatest compliance risk facing our industry and our company? And this really will give you a read on the individual's um, subject matter expertise, not just within the place that they work, but within the industries in general. Um, there's also a question, describe a situation when you tried to influence a senior executive on a compliance matter and accounted resistance. And then also question number nine, describe a task where you had to complete uh, with in a task that you had to complete with inadequate resources. So just the level of understanding in these questions really um, touches upon things that we talk about every week about, you know, how does a compliance officer do more with less? How do you uh, take care of inoculating your company from potential problems? So I think, uh, you know, I definitely agree with you that it's an invaluable source both for the interviewer and the interviewee, and it's uh, linked to in the show notes. So uh, everyone should uh, definitely download it and have a read. Um, next story that we have up is um, something that comes to us from Bob Conlin over at Navix, and it's entitled, I could be the least trustworthy person at my company, sincerely the CEO. And this is looking at uh, statistics that from the 218 Edelman Trust Barometer, only 44% of people trust CEOs. And uh, fortunately, that's a slight uptick of 7%, but there still leaves a significant amount of uh, work that needs to be done. Uh, Tom, why do you think this lack of trust is out there? And, and how do companies, and especially CEOs, bridge the gap? So, Jay, before I answer that question, let me just uh, step back and say uh, Bob Conlon's the CEO at Navex, also fellow uh, U of M grad. So uh, sorry we didn't win uh, Monday, but uh, we're number two. Nevertheless, uh, he occasionally posts pieces. And uh, as busy as he is as the Navex CEO, I find that when he posts, because it is um, not certainly as often as you or I might post, Jay, it speaks uh, volumes uh, when he does post. And that really mm-hmm. struck me in this one where um, he, he pointed out on the Edelman Trust Barometer, uh, as you noted, that CEOs really uh, are, are showing a lack of trust. And it, uh, if we can tie it back to Zuckerberg, it's certainly one thing, Jay, for you and I to say, well, we don't really trust Zuckerberg because he doesn't get it. But even more importantly, as Bob points out, that ethical lapses at the top can have a significant trickle-down impact on uh, the employees. And uh, it's identified from a Harvard Business Review study as the stigma effect of having worked for a company that engages in misconduct really spreads much further than the executives who have uh, engaged in the misconduct. And uh, it really drove home the point that CEOs uh, and those really in the public light need to do better. They need to understand that uh, because of their position, more is expected of them. More may be given, but as um, as um, Spider Man's uncle said, Uncle uh, is it Uncle Charlie, um, Uncle Ben, uh, to, Uncle Ben. Uh, to those who too much Aunt is, given, and much is expected, and that's certainly true of the CEOs, and that we've got to get the trust level up for CEOs because they do set a tone. And they set a tone for those in the organization while they're there. They set a tone for how those people may be perceived in the marketplace. 
So it really pointed to, I thought, a broader uh, issue, uh, certainly a broader problem, but also a broader solution. And uh, like I said, when Bob Conlon Conlon speaks, not only should you listen to it, but he says it uh, in, in my mind in a very loud voice that makes it even more important for us to consider the substance. And this piece was just great. Next up, uh, we have an article from Henry Cutter at the Wall Street Journal Risk and Compliance Journal talking about whistleblower scores under SEC safe harbor rule. So um, whistleblowers have just really been in the news the past couple months. And um, the safe harbor rule, Tom, is that something that has always been part of the whistleblower program or is that something new? Well, uh, I can't really say it's something new, Jay, but what we do have is the first award uh, to a whistleblower under under the safe harbor provision. And what the safe harbor provision basically means is that if you, um, as a whistleblower, provide information to another agency, another federal agency, the SEC will consider that as a report to Uh, the SEC itself, and it will give you the um, potential for a whistleblower bounty. Now, what we don't know, Jay, is if the whistleblower safe harbor provision would also protect you, because remember, the Dodd-Frank whistleblower provision has two components. One is the potential to share in a bounty, uh, but it's also the anti-retaliation provision. Uh, the protection provision, and that was the uh, question in front of the Digital Realty Trust versus Summers case. So we have Uh a um, whistleblower who receives part of an award. It doesn't really tell us about the protection part, um, but here we have a whistleblower who went to another um, agency, and uh, that was enough to, uh, because the SEC, it triggered an SEC investigation, it met the requirements of new and original information to the SEC, which allowed them to bring a, a claim or a charge that uh, it could not. So um, you're absolutely right, though, in terms of the amount of we've been talking about, thinking about uh, whistleblowers, and whistleblowers have been in the news literally with the Digital Realty Trust versus Summers case. Back in February, in March, we had the Largest whistleblower award ever of uh, $83 million, uh, given to three individuals, um, all represented by a Labaton, a Labaton a Sushiro law firm, um, who I interviewed uh, one of their partners, Stephen Durham, uh, for the uh, FCPA Compliance Report podcast. We'll post in a, a week or so on that, and we go over the details of that case, uh, sp- specifically focusing on the timing aspect. Uh, Jay, in that case, we had whistleblowers who did not receive the full 30 percent because they did not go to the SEC immediately after uh, they became aware of the securities law violations. They waited some period of time, so they received a a discount on their bounty. Uh, All of this is emphasizing the need for speed, if we can say that. Uh, You need to, if you want to qualify under a Dodd-Frank whistleblower, uh, even under the safe harbor provision, it means that you have to... Um, report report to an agency. Obviously, we don't know if that's going if the SEC is going to take the position that that would uh, give you whistleblower protection. Uh, I'm not sure under the digital tool uh, realty uh, trust case uh, if that uh, interpretation can be made now. But certainly for uh, the purposes of uh, receiving an award, uh, separate and apart from the anti retaliation provision. But as you said, Jay, lots of information on whistleblowers, and it's things that uh, both whistleblowers obviously need to be aware of, but also companies need to be aware of. And companies Mm -hmm. really need to amp up their compliance programs in light of Digital Realty Trust, in light of the – it was um, – uh, the the largest whistleblower awards from uh, March, and now uh, this uh, this new award, we don't know the uh, name of the company yet, but um, lots to think about, lots to talk about, and lots for the compliance professional, the compliance practitioner, the chief compliance officer, and corporate compliance programs to synthesize and try to incorporate because there's a big risk out there for them now. So if you said need for speed, does that make you maverick and it makes me goose? Well, I don't know. 
<laughs> because I don't know if it's me that has the need for speed. So uh, somebody who has the need to podcast is our good friend, Mike Volkov. And uh, not only have whistleblowers been in the news, but something, a little fun thing called the Don Raid. And Mike has put together another concise and informative podcast with basically um, a 10 point plan for how you deal with a search when the FBI comes a knocking at your door. Uh, what are your key takeaway, takeaways from that, Tom? So um, here, here's the thing that's so significant, I think, Jay. It's um, uh, Mike uh, Volkov is a former federal prosecutor. So he's bringing a level of expertise that uh, I don't think any other podcast in compliance has. Certainly uh, our podcast, uh, neither you nor I have that experience. Uh, in my podcast network, uh, I don't have that experience. Uh, there's no other podcaster talking about compliance who has that background. So from time to time, Mike brings in the federal prosecutorial perspective. And this is one that we wanted to highlight because no one, frankly, no one's talked about it. And I, I listened to it and emailed Mike. I said, you know, this is great. You need to actually put the 10 points up on a blog post so uh, people can download it and have it, uh, you know, taped up to their wall. So um, it, it, he literally lays out, here are the 10 things you need to do, and you need to plan now, uh, not uh, when you get the knock at the door. So we've linked to the podcast. Uh, I've asked Mike to post uh, the list. I'm not uh, quite sure when he'll do that, but check back on his, um, his website. And his podcast, from time to time, hit these criminal law uh, issues that nobody else is talking about, in, at least in the FCPA compliance perspective. So check it out. So talking about podcasts, uh, what did you spend the week thinking about podcast wise? So, Jay, this one, uh, this is uh, where I think you and I get to toot our own horn and rightfully so, because uh, you and I put together, along with uh, your colleagues, Eric Feldman and Vin DeCiani from Affiliated Monitors, of course, who sponsors this podcast, we put together a five podcast series on corporate monitorships, and uh, it's a uh, was a lot of fun. I learned a ton, which is one of the reasons I podcast so much because I learn as much as anybody. But Jay, we did it in a way that is each podcast is a um, 10 minute exposition on one particular topic. So we started with what is a corporate monitor with Vin. Then Eric explained to us in two separate episodes the differences between a pre settlement monitor and a post resolution monitor. Eric then told us some of the key uh, criteria that companies needed to uh, look at and consider when uh, uh, looking to hire a monitor. And then we wrapped it up on episode five with Vin coming back to talk about the always controversial topic of monitor costs and how do you try to get a handle on those from the company perspective. We released all of these on iTunes. We've released these on the um, uh, uh, each day on my site, the FCPA Compliance Report, and also on JD Supra. There is a uh, article uh, going with each one of these. We're going to put the articles together in a white paper for people. But it's a topic that most compliance practitioners have at least are aware of, but they haven't thought about the level of detail that we go into. So it's, it's, it was really, it is, it, it is a much greater resource than I had anticipated it would be. Uh, like I said, I certainly learned a lot. And the way we packaged it, that you could either uh, download all of the um, podcasts on iTunes on one day, if you wanted to binge out or if you wanted to listen to it over a, a, a five-day period, a 10-minute slot, uh, it was something that uh, every compliance practitioner needs to be aware of. Uh, whether you think your company uh, is going to have to go through an investigation and an enforcement action or you might need a monitor or, as, as you guys talk about often, uh, having a pre-settlement uh, monitor come in to help you uh, get ready uh, for any assessment, whether that be a, a regulatory assessment by the Department of Justice or SEC, assessment by your board of directors, assessment by a third-party contractor, or, or you want to do your own internal assessment. So lots of ways to slice and dice this. And I really think that we, the presentation we made gave the compliance practitioner a way to digest this information, which is uh, very useful in the compliance program going forward. So uh, Shout out to you for thinking this up and uh, helping me put this together. And I hope uh, everyone enjoyed our series as much as uh, certainly I enjoyed uh, interviewing Vin and Eric and uh, putting it together. 
Well, we, we, we had a great time doing it and, uh, we're already starting to think, uh, think about what we're going to put together for the month of May. So thank you so much. Um, how about a little info on the book and Jonathan Armstrong and what's happening from a conversion perspective? So uh, book sales, pre-sales are still going strong. Check it out on my website, www.fcpacompliancereport.com. Uh, I've uh, turned in the uh, the finals uh, proofs to the uh, publisher, and we're still on track for a end of April, 1st of May publication date. Uh, if you are in Houston next week, you need to come see Jonathan Armstrong. He's putting on a GDPR workshop. Uh, my, myself and my colleagues at the Greater Houston Business and Ethics Roundtable, Gerber, are putting it on. You can check it out on our site, Gerber, G-H-B-E-R dot org here in Houston. That's Tuesday, April 10th from 9 to 12 at South Texas College of Law. You can always uh, email me if you'd like some uh, more information on it. And then finally, Jay... On April 17th, if you're in Houston, I'm putting on or, or uh, leading a, a discussion at a roundtable hosted by Conversant. Uh, it will be a lunch discussion. Uh, I'm doing it the next day, April 18th in Dallas, and we're having a great conversation on driving ethics to the center of business through data. It's a, um, a talk and a subject I've wanted to explore for a long time, Jay. It's really innovation and compliance utilizing data. And we give you uh, some great uh, takeaways, but primarily a list of KPIs that you can utilize as the compliance practitioner uh, for your organization. So how do you measure the effectiveness? And then how do you measure the return on investment? Well, we start that conversation and, and we have a discussion about what are the key performance indicators. And I think this is where the next level of compliance will go, Jay. Uh, when you think about what the Department of Justice has wanted us to do in terms of operationalization, uh, but the step from operationalization, how do you determine whether it's operationalized and how do you determine it's effective? The next step is what's the return on the investment? If we're going to put this investment in, how do we show that we're actually more efficient or making more money uh, because of these steps? Well, this is the conversation that I'm leading and I'm facilitating. So it's going to be a conversation that I hope uh, will uh, really attract the, the compliance profession. I've certainly enjoyed uh, being a part of it. And I think it's going to lead us to the next level of compliance where it's compliance is seen not just as a business preventer, not as a legal um, requirement under the FCPA, but really as a, a business process, which, as I said, makes companies more efficient and at the end of the day, more profitable. So if you're in Houston the 17th or in Dallas the 18th, I hope you'll join us. Uh, you can uh, We've linked to it in the show notes. Uh, if you have any questions, you certainly feel free to uh, email me. Great. And we have um, one more thing to point out. Earlier this week on April 4th, uh, my colleague Eric Feldman and uh, Conversant's Autumn Sinelli, who's the Director of Solutions Engineering, they did a webinar together called Decades to Build, Seconds to Destroy, How Proactive Compliance Can Help You Avoid an Enforcement Action. So this is a little bit more, uh, Eric, looking at it from the uh, qualitative perspective, but still tying in the solutions and the data that Conversant offers. So um there will most definitely be a link to a replay of that, and we're also going to make that available to our colleagues in the EU. So, Jay, uh, when it turned out we went over quite a lot today. You want to take us home? Sure. So uh, on behalf of uh, Tom Fox and myself, Jay Rosen, we'd like to thank you for joining us for This Week in FCPA, episode number 97 coming up on 103 weeks away. And this uh, was the Facebook FUBAR uh, episode. So thank you for joining us and discussing all things ethics and compliance in FCPA. Have a great weekend. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. If you have any questions on anything you've heard, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you've listened to it on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast. That was a help in our rankings and also help us get the word out about the only weekly wrap-up in compliance and ethics. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.